Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, fireside chat. The intent of a fireside chat is to chat around a fire. Now, virtually, that's kind of difficult, although John has put uh, one in the background, a virtual fire in the background. Um, and uh, to just sort of, you know, at the end of a little hard day's work, connect, uh, discuss a few things, learn some more about each other and about what others are doing. Uh, and in this particular case, we're going to learn some more about what Sal is doing at Bison, uh, Bison People Land. Um, my name is Peter van der Gaag. Uh, I, am, uh, I work for the ERC Foundation, set up to support the Global Ecosystem Restoration Communities Movement, and I will be uh, our host around the fire, trying to make sure that uh, the conversation keeps, uh, keeps going and that it's a light. Bart has a fire behind him. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, usually during the session, more people come in uh, as they know that we start with exactly what I'm just starting with, which is a uh, short presentation about what's going on in the ERC movement right now. And then we'll go to John, who will uh, share his experiences in Dubai right now for the climate negotiations, share some of his thoughts uh, about what's going on there and uh, some of his ideas. And then we'll go to Sal, and Sal will. Uh, explain to you what uh, Bison uh, People Land is doing in uh, in the Dakotas with uh, this magnificent animal that you can see behind him. Um, but first, some news about the movement. So um, I hope it's it's visible. Uh, some some basic. Um, Usually at the Pfizer chat, you can interrupt each other, but in a virtual meeting, that's quite annoying. So if you have any questions, uh, hold them until after uh, Sal is, is done, or you can post them already into in the chat, and we will uh, record those and make sure Sal uh, is asked them uh, when he's done. Uh, there will be a question and answer ses session. We would prefer that you raise your hand and ask it in person, but if you're shy, uh, you can uh, you can post it also in the chat again. Uh, we hope, uh, well, we usually aim for one hour, but I've been at once where we last two and a half hours because of the conversations afterwards. We'll make sure there's plenty of time. If you, if you want to leave after one hour, of course, feel free to leave. Uh, you may have to cook dinner or uh, have something else on your agenda. Uh, that's fine, uh, but usually conversations last a bit longer. And of course, uh, please mute your microphone and turn off your video also uh, to save on bandwidth for people looking at this from places with uh, less uh, strong internet connections. Um, some quick plugs. There's a few uh, courses uh, taking place. The uh, Our first original ecosystem restoration design course is being launched again until the 10th of January you get a discount if you sign up. Uh, but it starts in February. It's an online course. Uh, there's a rewilding training in the UK in March uh, at Ambercombe. And then uh, there is a course that we're uh, doing together with Soil Food Web School. It's a study at your own pace course. You can sign up uh, at any time uh, through the Soil Food Web School website um, and, uh, and take this course, Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration. If you don't know how to find any of these things, you can go to erc.earth, find our education page, and you'll be linked to these courses there. Then um, there's a few volunteering opportunities. There is a long-term volunteering opportunity uh, through the EU Solidarity Corps uh, for younger people uh, in Spain, uh, in Kenya, uh, um, I actually don't know which ERC this is. Is this um, Karomi River, Kath? Yes, yes. Karomi River uh, is looking for a volunteer to uh, uh, yeah, combine your zoology and ecology knowledge. And there is there are some shorter and long-term um, uh, volunteering roles in Brazil currently available. Uh, again, Karomi River is looking for more volunteers. Um, the Arabuco Farm is looking for volunteers also in Kenya and in Costa Rica. Uh, there are uh, ongoing volunteer opportunities at the ERC there. 
Um, I usually ask for funds and donations, uh, this time specifically. Uh, Sal, who uh, was going to talk about his ERC, I'd like to point out that each ERC has the possibility to donate directly to them on our website, erc.earth. If you go to their page, it might be confusing. There's a big orange or teal blue donate button. That's donations to the movement as a whole. But on the page, about halfway, you'll see a little green donate button. And that's a donation straight to the ERC. Uh, if you are very keen on uh, supporting a particular initiative, you can use that donate button and we'll make sure those funds get to this ERC so that they can use them for what Sal wrote down in his in his system, all the things that he would like to do with uh, with the fun funding that he gets. Um, and that's it. That's all for my for my side uh, for this uh, introduction. And um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you follow us, if you go to erc.earth, you'll see all the other opportunities that are out there. You can meet some of the other ERCs on there. Make sure you follow us on social media. Uh, almost daily, things are being posted from uh, some of the great activities that take place around the world. Uh, and our newsletter, of course, uh, brings lots of death. But you're probably here because you receive our newsletter, because that's how we reach most people. Um, Guy is coming in. Lots of ERCs here. So, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I now give the floor to John. John, uh, reflect on what you wish to reflect on, please. Hello, everyone from Dubai. I have been now for the, um, this is the ninth day that I've been here for the convening of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I wasn't involved in the direct negotiations between the, the, the countries, but in side events for many different countries and with many of the organizations that the camps and communities work with and also the common lands partners and the special host for me was the uh, four per 1,000 soil carbon initiative that was created by the French government. And I gave them a keynote speech uh, on their opening day of their partners meeting, which went very well. So I was pretty happy about that. But I think if you read the news, you're going to find that while there were incremental things that took place, probably it's not terribly dramatic what's going to come out of this. And I think it highlights the fact that we really all need to just realize we're going to have to do it. People are going to have to do it. Whatever's happening at these meetings or in political discussions or in scientific discussions or policy discussions, they're all theoretical. So they're not really quite the same as if you're building a compost pile or you're planting out food forests or botanical sanctuaries or you're rewilding. All of those things, or you're restoring the hydrological function, clearing rivers, restoring rivers, making sure that there's no erosion. I mean, the easiest thing we can do is stop the erosion. So by taking on that challenge, not only are we doing it, which is gonna protect us, our families, our, our, our communities, but it's great creating huge value. So if the world doesn't understand it yet, they will soon. So anybody who understands this needs to, in, to internalize the understanding that humanity as a whole must restore all degraded lands on the earth, that this is mitigation and adaptation to climate change. This is lowering surface temperatures. This is infiltrating and rehydrating dehydrated biomes, and we can lower the risks from floods and wildfires and mudslides. And 
we can also create food security for everybody. So I think this is what we really need to do and what we actually must do if we are to succeed. And it, the, we have the power to do it. And it, it's, there is a question, always people talk about how much does it cost? What's the price? I think we need to turn that argument on its head and realize what's the price of not doing this. We can't afford not to do this. And we need to learn how to really also understand emotionally and philosophically and spiritually that this is a duty. This is not a, um, it's not like an optional thing if we, if we decide, oh, well, I really don't, people are not, are not reacting, so I'm not going to do it if they're not going to do it. I don't think this is going to work because if if we don't choose to restore earth systems, we're going to have terrible consequences. We're already experiencing this. So today we're going to hear about a very special place in in North America and about a very long-standing group of people who have been working in this area of of stewarding the lands. And we, if we read the history, it's terrifying. So I, I remember as a teenager reading Black Elk Speaks, which is about this region, about what happened to the Lakota people, and also reading about what happened to the, to the bison. So this is going to be very interesting. I hope you enjoy it. And I'll stay around afterwards as long as the technology works and we can talk. And uh, anybody who has any questions about the COP, I could try to answer them. And uh, thank you so much. Welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thanks. So it is up to us. Uh, and I think that is true. I think leaders are likely to follow uh, uh, people that are doing well and I think and doing right and I think that's what's happening at the CRCs. We're now going to go to Sal, Sal Gangirelli, if you can turn on your camera, um, talking to us from the Black Hills in South Dakota, uh, where, uh, well, let's just say bad land management over decades um, is, uh, is degrading the landscape and you want to work with the bison and, and the people uh, the Lakota tribes that are there, uh, and with your own skills to connect with people and to connect people with nature, hoping to restore that landscape uh, and and allow it to bounce back, which I think you are uh, you are convinced that will work. That's um, it's up to you now, Sal, to tell what 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 you're doing, Sal. Uh, thank you, Peter and and John. Um, yeah, so I. I definitely want to just share, as we always do, you know, when I do a presentation, I always uh, start with gratitude. And um, I'm very grateful for the bison. I'm grateful to the Lakota people. I'm definitely grateful to the Lakota family that adopted me at a young age and then started to teach me and, and train me really to understand um, these principles and then now applied them to the land. So, you know, so much gratitude for all that supports uh, this movement that I'm a part of. And you know, really all of us, you know, kind of like John says, getting our, our feet on the ground and getting our hands in the dirt and actually doing the work and not just uh, debating it or trying to figure out how to monetize it, but actually doing it. So I'm um, really grateful for, you know, this, this group and to be a part of this group as well. So I, I actually created a little uh, presentation, a PowerPoint, which I haven't done in a very long time, but um, I did it again. And I'd like to share that with you as part of this. So we'll see if if that works for you all. And I'm hoping you see the first slide and we'll start. Um, the project, um, it's gone through a kind of a big iteration of different names and different ideas along the way. We actually started as a small, a small project called the Bison Project and then eventually it became Bison People Land. And, you know, there's different ways to think of that. It's not like uh, Disneyland, you know, it, it was actually gonna be hyphenated at one point, you know, recognizing that the bison the people in the land are all significant in the organization um, that 
we have developed. And this organization is, you know, about land regeneration and it's about human beings relationship to the land and this ancient, you know, kind of fundamental, let's say indigenous way that people have interacted with um, for millennia, you know, before the modern age to actually create balance and health on the land. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my background and kind of the philosophy that I come from. But the idea is that the bison are a incredibly uh, important species for this landscape. And that when people interact with the bison in, the health, in a healthy way, supporting the bison, the bison essentially manage the land. So it really depends upon um, human beings understanding their place and their role within the ecosystem as uh, a managing species that manage other species that manage the ecosystem. So returning the bison to this, uh, this place where historically has been for you know, tens of thousands of years, if not longer, um, is a really important part of what we're, we're all about. And to introduce you to kind of the bison people and team, obviously that's me over there in the left of your, of your screen. And, um, you know, there's uh, my wife, Erica, who is uh, really our operations manager. You know, she is uh, an instrumental part of this whole organization, and she really does take care of the bison in incredible ways. So much so, I think they recognize her almost as part of the herd. Um, I, uh, I'll, again, talk about my background a little bit, but uh, I was married into the Lakota tribe. Um, this is the Native American peoples of this land, and my sons are all Lakota. Um, and my wife, uh, from that marriage, that was now, what, 17, 18 years ago. So it's been a while. Um, but I've remarried to Erica, and our daughter is Layla. So Anthony is my oldest son from that marriage. Um, and he is half Lakota, obviously, among other things. And um, he is really another instrumental piece of this organization. And he among his brothers and his uncles and a few other people are part of bringing the bison people land onto the Native American reservation called the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation here in South Dakota. Layla is my daughter with Erica and she is another instrumental part of caring for the bison in the land here that we live on. Um, I also have my son Adrian who is very much a part of it and um, tends the bison oftentimes here and he's part of bringing it onto the local reservation and then we have uh, Alex Travers we call him feathers um, and his uh, his support staff role is really around website and education he is an incredible nature connection um, educator and he works really well with children he's done that for for decades now um, bringing kids upon the land teaching them about uh, the ecology and, and human being interaction with that so um, and Janet Dowell, who I didn't have a picture for, but some of you know her from ERC. Uh, she was the one that actually introduced me to ERC, and she is in kind of a support consultation role with us as well. So um, her name is definitely worth mentioning here in the, the team. So what's what's the vision of uh, Bison People Land? You know, the, the philosophy we come from is that people are an integral part of the landscape. And, you know, it definitely... Um, is in contradiction to maybe the modern perspective of people being a detriment to uh, the ecology and to the earth. But um, the indigenous perspective is that we're actually essential, uh, an essential component to the uh, environment. So the, the focus, one of the focuses is the people and actually helping people to renew this um, relationship that we have historically had with the environment and how to, um, relate to it, how to connect to it, how to think about it, how to express that connection in ways that actually um, makes the ecology abundant and well. So obviously, you know, the philosophy side of it, you know, and the education side of it, the knowledge side of it is only as good as the application. So we have to put this understanding into practice. And that's where the ecological restoration of the land to really support the stable biodiversity and um, the growth of, you know, abundance within the ecosystem. And I know we'll, we all know that story very well, you know, water systems, soil systems, um, 
the plant systems, the animal systems. And this is where we get into actually working with the bison. And the bison uh, are essential to this landscape and for many different reasons in what they do and how they interact with the landscape. If we manage the bison correctly, then the bison essentially manage the rest of the ecology well. You know, that's not a hundred percent, you know, it's not an absolute, but it is it is a, a definitely a cornerstone of this this ecology, you would say the Great Plains area of North America. So again, my my background, um, I've uh, I was essentially adopted by the Lakota tribe, but in particular this family group within the Lakota tribe. Um, the the what we call the Wopduka Tioshpaye, the Wopduka lineage. And they are uh, people that, um, as John even mentioned, uh, you know, they are recognized as uh, people that really hold a deep spiritual connection to the land. And one of the people of this lineage is actually Black Elk, uh, who was written about in the book Black Elk Speaks, where he described what happened to the Lakota people as they were forced through a genocidal process. Um, disconnecting from the land, the extermination of the bison. Uh, and there's different family groups within the, the Lakota people who have really held on to their traditional understanding, their, the wisdom of the earth, and really ultimately the wisdom of their philosophy and spirituality. And that was my background. I was brought into that when I was 15 years old. And um, I've basically been educated in that ever since. So now going on 35 plus years. So a lot of times when people hear of the Lakota traditions or even Native American or indigenous traditions, um, but I'd say particularly Lakota traditions, it has a lot of like spiritual connotations, you know, which then kind of gets translated into a religious uh, uh, mindset. But uh, what it really comes down to is it is actually more pragmatic, uh, ecological understanding. And how to apply that is uh, something that we're working on understanding and kind of reactivating it into a, a physical doing as compared to as com, uh, compared to that kind of philosophical idea of like spirituality. It is much more pragmatic. It's much more about here's the steps that you need to take to manage this land and to really live as human beings in a good way with the earth. So that's that's where I come from, and that has heavily, heavily influenced uh, the Bison People Land Project. You know, it's probably the thing that maybe sets this project of, uh, uh, apart from maybe a more mainstream uh, scientific uh, ecological restoration project. So our team obviously is really diverse. Um, this this is just kind of the key stakeholders which I have named as part of the team, but it actually is quite quite big and it's supported by people from all over the world um, it centers on this this landscape and the Lakota people as the indigenous people of this region and of course that includes my children and my sons and their extended family on the reservation um, but the, the the team actually is really big and it's allies from all over the world and our background, you know, where we started was really with education, and we've done nature connection camps here in the Badlands, the, the Prairie, and then the Black Hills. This is kind of this western region of South Dakota for over 10 years, um, with, with a real focus on the Native American youth, particularly from Pine Ridge, you know, bringing them into nature and having them learn the skills of um, the, natural, the natural world and you know, what maybe some people would call bushcraft skills or survival skills, everything from tracking to fire making to shelter building, uh, these types of activities, which um, the, 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 maybe the surface level looks like, you know, kind of a survival um, type of focus, but it actually is more about the connective uh, element behind it. You know, when you know how to build a, or do a fire from friction, rubbing sticks together, you know, your awareness of the environment is uh, profoundly affected and who you see yourself as as part of that environment is actually incredible in the ways that it shifts. Um, you know, so it's not about just building fire and knowing how to utilize fire and, and you know, making fire in these kind of primitive or um, traditional methods, but it is actually more about 
the connections that are instilled within that person so that they know place, that they know who they are and that they, uh, you know, kind of enact this connection into a, the world in a bigger way. So one of the big things that has happened within the bison people land is in 2019, we did purchase uh, a private property here in the Black Hills, 55 acres now in total. And this is where the center of activities are taking place for the um, eco restoration and as well as the uh, educational camps that we, we actually host and, and provide. So the, the bison, you know, the bison's a really fascinating creature you know, where it comes from, how it's migrated around the world, um, the different stories that go uh, with the bison. And, you know, the indigenous perspective is definitely different than the, the mainstream kind of evolutionary perspective. But the, the, the understanding is that the bison has been around for a very long time and that it actually originated in a different area, different land. They say actually Southeast Asia. And that it migrated around the world and uh, it ended up in North America from this great migration. And, and at one point, essentially, bison were all over the northern hemisphere and they actually still are. Uh, the, the, the human being interaction with bison started a very long time ago in that we have this really incredible history with the, the bison. And the reason um, that can be verified is even the earliest records of human being expression of that is in these caves in France where um, these cave paintings of bison were done 36,000 years ago. So people have this kind of uh, history with bison, but it also, there's something I say that really stirs within people uh, when they come into contact with bison or they see bison and it's some, you know, kind of primal ancient memory that, is is kind of brought to the surface of this connection this respect this love this caring um, this awe that the bison bring into our lives so I, I you know for one really appreciate just what these animals are now the bison you know in north america there's actually three different types um well there's there's actually you know technically more than three types but they're often the two that get the most acknowledgement is the plains bison and the wood bison. Um, there's also the mountain bison. So these bison are slightly different. If to the untrained eye, you probably wouldn't notice much of a difference, but um, these bison at one point were somewhere around 50 million. Um, this is, let's say pre colonization in, in early, in the early, uh, time when bison were not affected by the uh, my, the movement of um, the the immigrants across the land, the estimate is in the tens of millions, and it is um, estimated to be the largest aggregation of animals known in recorded history. Uh, there was just so many bison, and by the 1900s, the bison were basically driven to extinction or near extinction through aggressive depopulation. Um, and that was primarily done by the U.S. government and supported by the U.S. government to control the, the Native American, the indigenous populations who heavily relied on bison for food, for materials, for shelter. Um, really, every, every need was in some ways tied to the bison. And by eliminating the bison, the Native American peoples could no longer sustain their lifestyle, their their traditions and they were forced to be put onto the Native American reservations. So when we get into the indigenous ecology understanding, their understanding comes from this really ancient wisdom that has developed over time in their relationship to this animal. And the understanding is that human beings, again, are a really essential part of managing the ecosystem. And when done well, then the ecosystem th uh, really it thrives, it flourishes. So the the traditions, especially with the Lakota, are centered on how do we manage the bison in a good way, and how do we prioritize um, the the balance and the abundance of the earth, so that you could really say that we're all wealthy. And in wealth, in this point of view, isn't about material items. Wealth is about the abundance of life, the, the experience of life, and that 
we as not just human beings, but we as in the entire ecology are part of um, this abundance principle. And the bison are recognized to really hold that abundance principle that it seems to be when the bison interact with the land that the, the abundance of the land in many, many different ways increases. So if we're managing the bison, the bison essentially manage the rest of the ecosystem. And that the, the kind of correct support around the bison populations and their movements creates balance for the soil, the plants, and the animals. So the bison, you know, that they were eliminated um, was obviously a significant thing for the indigenous people and kind of parallels their, uh, their experience with um, the dominating culture at that time. The bison were eliminated in Essentially, in many ways, so were they. Um, when the first contact was made in this region with the U.S. government, they created treaties. And the one that oftentimes gets the most focus is the 1868 treaty, um, which they established the Great Sioux Reservation, which they said is this is unceded territory uh, of the Lakota people. And it actually encompassed um, the western South Dakota, but it also included areas of five different states, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota. So the, this area was considered the native territory or the Lakota territory. Um, but then unfortunately, um, as the story goes, General Custer and the 7th Cavalry uh, made an expedition into the Black Hills, technically illegally, and discovered gold. And once that word got out, there was a gold rush into the Black Hills and the treaty had to be reworked, which was really manipulated to the point where the native peoples were forced onto the reservations out into the plains and away from the Black Hills. And the, the reservation has, you know, its own history. But the recognition is that this land that we're residing on right now is actually still technically unseceded land of the Indian ter territory, the uh, 1868 treaty. So people oftentimes ask, you know, are you on a reservation? And, you know, it's kind of a really complex answer, you know, if you get into it. But the simple answer is yes, technically, we are still on the reservation. And it's so much so that in the 1980s, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, agreed that this land had been stolen from the Lakota, that there was no justification really in how it was manipulated and that um, they were awarded a $1.2 million settlement for um, a payment, if you will, for the Black Hills and for this, this, this territory, which uh, the tribes never took. So, and they still haven't to this day, the, the tribes refuse to because they say, basically, if we accept that money, then we have agreed to the sale and we're not agreeing to the sale. So they don't want the money. They want at least some of the, the land, which the many of the tribes have been actually pursuing reclaiming and buying back the land and there's you know for those who know there's a kind of a bigger movement with this land back um, where the indigenous people not just of the Lakota but of other tribes of North America um, are looking to reach have that land returned to them so that they can manage it with these you know traditional practices and and really address these issues that we're talking about you know ecological restoration but with um, their understanding in their history as connected to that particular piece of land. So ultimately the land was confiscated uh, illegally and the tribes, you know, are, are still interacting with that. And, you know, this is part of the story of bison people land because we're, you know, a Lakota uh, indigenous organization as well. And so we have, we have this aspect of, you know, what we're working with, um, which I think is only correct, especially in places where there are indigenous people, you know, looking to work directly with that and to make sure that um, the, the understanding that they traditionally hold um, is very well respected. And of course, that's my background anyways, which it makes it no problem for me. But, you know, to include um, the, that relationship is, I'd say, a very important element of at least our philosophy. So the pictures you're seeing, um, basically all the pictures you're seeing are from the landscape that um, includes that 55 acres. 
And this particular piece of land, it was really impacted in a number of ways um, that degraded the landscape. And the first way was primarily the, um, um, this land was used as a gold mine. And uh, most of the mining that happened in this particular region was placer mines. So they were, uh, you know, they were panning for gold mostly. There are some sloughs and there are some maybe heavier equipment in certain areas just down the road. But um, a lot of the landscape and even our our uh, private property here that, um, you know, the boundaries are just the long, the, the old streams and the rivers, the, the washes, because that was how they set up the claim and that's how it became private land is that it's was just along the waterways where they could pan for gold. Uh, so it's kind of interesting when you look at the plots of land, uh, the way that they're shaped because they're very narrow, very long. And at the center point of that typically is a, a river or a wash, what used to be a river. So after, after uh, gold was discovered um, in great abundance up in the northern Black Hills, the mining pretty much stopped. Everybody moved up to a place called Deadwood. Uh, if you've heard of that, it's a very historic and well-known town. Uh, and that's where the mining uh, really, really took another uh, level. And uh, it's still actually in operation there to some degree. So after the mine was closed, then it became cattle land. And, you know, that's, you know, obviously the transition from the bison at this point in time, the, the bison went from that 50 million population down to about 500 in the entire country. And the, the estimates that it was definitely in the hundreds and it was really just a key couple of people who uh, saved the bison and started to breed them and protect them, you know, including some zoos, but Yellowstone National Park, Custer State Park later, um, a very uh, kind of well-renowned person within the, the group was uh, actually a, a Texas uh, rancher by the last name of Nightingale. His wife and him um, saved the, the Southern Range bison uh, from extinction, you know, basically gathering up calves that were uh, bleeding or crying out for their mothers that had been murdered and then raising them by hand and returning the bison. So so the, the bison population um, was essentially gone in the early 1900s and cattle grazing became the, uh, the, the main animal, if you will, that walked on this land that ate and, you know, we'll talk about this, but the cattle have significantly different behavior patterns than bison. So again, in this land, uh, in, from 1900 to 1980, there was actually a sawmill in this region, right actually in the, our front yard so to speak. And uh, this was the main site for harvesting trees and silent. And then uh, eventually you get some private ownership in this area. And that includes us at this point, but really there's probably about four families that live in this entire area. Um, most people uh, are, you know, this is their, their vacation home, their summer home or their getaway location. So there's actually, it's not very populated um, most people, they find the, the area very harsh and the winters actually here are very harsh. Um, this morning being one of those, you know, it's very, very cold. It can get down into definitely the negative 50s we've seen with wind chill factors. That's Fahrenheit. So um, it's pretty much, I think, the same in Celsius, but the winters here can be brutal. You can get snowed in for, you know, days at a time, even up to a week before you can even attempt to get out. So it's not, it's not, um, a hospitable landscape that in the winter, but um, the bison love it. You know, they are, they are, uh, you know, they actually enjoy the winter more than the summer. I'd say they, they oftentimes when it's cold and they start playing and jumping around and having fun. Um, so yeah, if us, we, we own at this point 23 hectares um, and we're at a population of 6,400 feet, you know, somewhere around 19, 1900 kilometers and um, you know again those degrading factors some of them I, I already already spoke to but um, this is the area if you could see at least part of the Black Hills from an aerial view um, then this is what the Black Hills look like it's not a very big area uh, it's it's a range of mountains that rose up out of the earth about 400 million years ago and uh, it's um, it's, uh, I believe it's about 80, 
uh, 80 miles across and 120 miles uh, uh, vertical or in length. So it's it's really a, a tiny area, kind of an island of mountains within the prairie. And um, the Lakota, they call this the heart of all there is. And when, if you look at the aerial view, it actually it actually looks like the heart, not you know not the symbolic. Uh, heart that we have like Valentine's Day, but uh, like a human heart or an animal heart, you know, has that shape. So they say this is the heart of all that there is. And, and uh, it's a significant uh, location for many, many tribes, not just Lakota. Um, well, one thing that happened in this circle that you see is what we call the Jasper fire. And this, this massive fire burned about 20 years ago. And, and where you don't see trees within that circle is pretty much where that fire uh, burnt from, and um, that has obviously severely affected the uh, the ecosystem. Um, and the trees are are starting to come back. Some trees obviously survived, uh, but the the way that that fire burned and the intensity of it, as many of these fires tend to be in this day and age, uh, the fuel the fuel that was uh, available for that fire was just incredible. And fortunately, we. We have in this area aspen and those nursery plants that are and have come in to re, uh, rehabilitate the land and start creating the um, the habitat for the pines to come in after them. So that's well on its way, and in this little spot that we have, obviously supported by the bison. So the another degrading factor is having um, having cows as compared to bison and elk on the land uh, actually is. Uh, a huge factor for this landscape because cows, their preference is to be by water sources and and actually um, start eroding or or create more erosion around water sources. You know, it's said that the the European cow, its ancestry is more from something like a water buffalo, something that wants to be in the water. Where the bison, they really do not like to stay by water very often. It, their priority is really to drink and then to get up on high places and to get in the open spots where they can see. So they, they don't spend long at the waterways. The hooves of European cattle as compared to bison are vastly different. The soft hooves, hooves of the European cattle actually pack the land and it creates kind of this hard pan, which prevents um, um, seed to infiltrate the soil. And uh, over time that is really detrimental where the bison hooves are, sharp and they break up the soil and they allow the the seeds to be planted from the grasses and the wildflowers and even the trees so that they regenerate so these are a number of the factors that have been impacted this particular land that we're on so what are our activities well we're looking at obviously restoring this land and increasing the biodiversity and health in the way we do that is through our human management, through the human impact and really understanding that and coming to understand that in a very practical way, uh, taking the, the teachings and um, maybe the more philosophical elements that come from the Lakota Sioux and applying it into you know, a, a small, relatively small area of land, but um, doing that in that kind of connected spirit and understanding and, and learning how does this work well and what what we need to do in this day and age uh, especially with the fencing and and with the systems that we're dealing with with roads with limited movement so um we're doing that now we've done it with uh three bison we purchased three of them in 2019 one uh male one bull and then two females and this is actually a picture of the the bull that we purchased he is what's called a uh, uh a baby bottle uh, bison, which means that for whatever his reason, his mother was not able to care for him and um, he would have to be hand fed. So we bottle fed him for pretty much about five months. He started to graze and he slowly got adopted into the, uh, the little herd of the other two bison. The females were uh, a year older than him and uh, they're very, very social creatures. So they really need to be around one another. So they were very quickly paired up. And um, yeah, they, uh, um, they're, they're, it's a growing thing. Um, and 
the the male um, did impregnate one of our females, so we we do have actually a new calf that was born here on the land, and it's a she. So um, yeah, she's really grown, and she no longer looks like the the cinnamon phase that you see there on your slide. She's now um, getting the darker colors, and she's quite a bit bigger. But this is how they look when they're probably about a week week and a half old. Um, we are managing the bison. Uh, these are our two females, by the way. Uh, we called them 505 and 437 for obvious reasons. When we bought them, uh, they had these air tags as part of the herd they came from, so we haven't messed with them. Uh, I think they actually might like them and to some degree, like their earrings, and uh, they. Uh, it's easy to identify them. 505 is definitely the matriarch, and she's the leader, and 437 is the mom to the new bison calf. So uh, she uh, she did a great job delivering her first her first calf. And it was pretty wonderful to see, you know, just coming upon uh, the, the little herd with a new baby and uh, knowing that 437 did that all on her own, which is another reason why bison and actually cattle are significantly different. Cattle need a lot of support in birthing because of the genetic manipulation over time as compared to bison, which pretty much go off, have their babies, and next thing you know, you have a, another baby with a mom. Um, so the, the management system, though, that we're using is holistic management, you know, with rotational grazing. Uh, we have a number of paddocks within this small area, and we need to move them, you know, on a fairly regular basis uh, throughout the spring into the summer and in the fall. And then um, during the winter, we do have to supplement because – for various reasons, one being that our, our kind of uh, water systems, um, our food systems for the animals need that support in this area. So they're, uh, they're even just, you know, getting them moved in snow that's six feet deep with, with drifts is not, not too easy. So we keep them in one area where we just feed them from that area. And uh, they seem to enjoy it because they don't have to do much work, but uh, that's the condition that we're in right now with this particular area. So the goal is obviously uh, eco re restoration, you know, you utilizing the bison as a means to uh, accelerate that and uh, making sure that people have the opportunity to re really restore, you know, hu humanity's old relationship with the bison ex extending around at least the Northern hemispheres you know, recognizing that people had this, whether they're European, Asian, or North American, you know, this is, this is something that people had for uh, millennia. And, uh, you know, giving that opportunity to connect and actually feed a bison or, or come into, you know, kind of close proximity with bison in a safe way is part of what we're able to provide. Um, and as we've said, you know, using indigenous uh, techniques and understandings, but also using modern scientific approach, you know, soil measurements, uh, the, the different uh, opportunities to look at this from a more scientific perspective is something that we're including as well. And uh, definitely, we've been very supported in that with uh, and by Janet Dowell. She's one of the consultants around that. So um, we want to verify that this is working, not just through observation, but also through uh, measurement as well. So we're working with uh, the modern scientific approach. So what do we do right now? Well, we've been hosting camps here at this location since we purchased it for four, four years. Um, and these are nature connection camps. These are experiential camps in different ways that bring people into relationship to themselves, to nature, into community. And um, this is, you know, something that we've been doing for now, actually over 10 years um, in different regions, but in particular, this greater uh, Western South Dakota. Uh, we built up the infrastructure to do so because when we moved onto this land, there was essentially what what's a, a double wide trailer. You know, it's a it's a home, but it is uh, underneath it, it has axles and wheels. So it's not a well built sturdy home, but it is sufficing for us to get established here. And in that, we, um, we started to build up the infrastructure to support 40 or more people at a time, including the toilets, showers, outdoor teaching spaces, 
We utilize teepees oftentimes, you know, as a temporary shelter. We have camping sites and a camp kitchen. Um, and we've done, you know, we've done a, quite a bit of work um, in this area. Um, the different camps that we teach, the language of the land camp, we every year uh, we sponsor a, uh, a nature connection camp experience for the Lakota Sioux children. You know, anyone who can attend that, it's open, it's free. Um, it is open to others as well. Anyone that wants to attend it can, but um, for the Lakota people, it's free. And I would really say all of our uh, teaching events, uh, there's no charge, no cost for uh, tribally enrolled Indigenous people, in particular the Lakota people. So we, we make it as accessible as possible, honoring and recognizing that uh, my relationship to where these teachings come from. And also, you know, obviously the Lakota people and uh, Indigenous people in this region uh, are, are they're, you know, they're not wealthy people. You know, they don't have the extra money to spend on a camp or a gathering or some sort of a, event. Uh, they're actually one of the most, uh, the poorest um, people in, in the poorest county in the United States is, is on the reservation in the Pine Ridge Reservation. So we make sure that we support that relationship. Um, we do the helpers gathering camps, which is a particular camps focus more on the spiritual, uh, you know, side of the nature connection. So it's, uh, it's part of the group that we have that really we started with called the helpers mentoring society. Um, we're actively growing the bison herd, we're looking at uh, acquiring a couple more uh, bulls and, and cows as well. Um, you know, with the goal of breeding the animals and growing the herd and expanding the land base onto especially the reservation. So in my son's family and their extended family, they have uh, a square mile, what they call a section, 640 acres of land. And that's one of the locations that we're looking at expanding the bison upon, which could hold vastly greater numbers. So um, there's a there's an expansion process into the formal reservation, not just the unseceded territory here. And we're doing plant and, um, and tree restoration, in particular, some of the fruit bearing trees of this region, which are incredibly hardy, uh, choke cherry. That's really the main fruit tree of this, of this area. And um, there's some plums, but the, the, uh, the average fruit bearing tree, like an apple tree or something, it just can't endure the weather of this location. So we have to work with the indigenous plants. We're managing some of the aspen groves, which are the nursery plants. They come in after big wildfires. Um, the root systems um, don't die off. So the, the aspen trees grow up in groves and that provides the habitat for the next wave of pine trees to start growing in that shade. And eventually the pine trees shade out the aspen groves, which die back, but um, the root system stays alive. So we're working and managing all that. We also have the affiliates. You know, we're working with a number of different organizations, including the National Bison Association, the Deter Dakota Territory Bison Association, the Intertribal Bison Council, obviously Helpers Mentoring Society as the main organization that's supporting bison people and, and echo restoration communities. So those are our main associations and affiliates. Um, and, you know, what we're looking at, as I said, we're looking at expanding the bison herd onto the Indian reservation, working with my sons. Well, uh, part of working with the bison is that, you know, they're, they're both viewed as wildlife and as livestock. And um, the livestock aspect of working with bison is a relatively new, um, let's say, experience. You know, people, cattle ranchers who have maybe ranched cattle for generations are actually slowly converting to uh, raising bison as a livestock. Um, bison meat, as many people know, is incredible. It's very, very healthy. Uh, it has, um, you know, for those who interact with it that way, we meat, um, it has huge health benefits, heart health benefits. And, um, and so a lot of people over the course of the last really 20 years, the ranchers have been converting more and more to bison. Um, we're, we're looking at expanding that because that can actually also provide, um, not just 
ecological restoration for the indigenous communities here, uh, but also uh, a source of income. So it's uh, financially as well for people working the animals, but also for the sale of the meat, uh, the, the hide, uh, the different ways that the animal has historically been used in every sort of way that is imaginable support uh, the people. So that's an ongoing thing. And, and, you know, we're always looking to develop the organization affiliates, how we can tap in and link together to create stronger networks. Um, you know, what do we need? Well, we're, we're always, you know, looking for how do we make this work better? And one of the things obviously is, uh, you know, structure out here is so important and, and having a structure that can endure the weather for three or four seasons is, um, is something that we're still developing and working on. Um, and in that way we can actually teach more people, um, and hold, uh, bigger camps, have more, more opportunity for people to come support the land, the restoration, education, and of course the bison. Um, with that, you know, we're, we're managing bison, um, with fencing now. And it's, it's part of the condition we find ourselves in, you know, bison, the imagination is that they could roam across North America free and wild migrating with the seasons, which would be ideal. But the reality is, is we're, we're combined into these small areas with, uh, with fencing that has to hold the bison and really protect them as much as protect the, the general public. Uh, the bison, um, they're wild animals, which means that they, um, they can be emotionally reactive. You know, they're pretty calm. They're, you know, like all of us, I would say, like they don't really want trouble, but when they sense danger, then they react to that. Uh, and that's whether it's perceived a real danger, they still react to it. And so being powerful, big animals, you know, even the, the weighing up to uh, a thousand, a ton, two, 2,000 pounds, some of the bigger males can get up to the females being somewhere around, you know, 13, 1500 pounds. Um, they, they, uh, could go through a fence very easily. So, um, having the right kind of fencing and then also having, um, areas that they can rotationally graze through and move is part of what we're working on. So cross fencing and then, um, you know, getting them access to water, within that limited space is also part of the, 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 I guess you could say the challenge because a lot of the um, irrigated land, a lot of the land with the water, uh, the streams has already been leased by cattle ranchers and uh, it's, it's harder to get access to. So really drill, in this area, drilling wells fortunately works. The, the table level is not too deep. And, uh, and that's something that we're needing in different areas of this landscape. Um, and as we go, you know, we're looking at these different aspects of uh, eco restoration. Um, so supporting, you know, these, these different uh, incentives uh, would, yeah, it's always appreciated. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of our, our bull. Unfortunately, our bull uh, that we hand raised, we actually had to cull. Um, and part of the reason being is that uh, he was not uh, very fearful of people. And I don't mean like that in a bad way. I think uh, the animals have to have a certain level of caution with people. And, and I would actually say kind of a respect. Uh, they're so powerful and they're so big that one swing of their heads could actually severely injure and even kill a human being. And it would be nothing to a, another bison. It's actually the way that they communicate. Um, they talk through clanking their heads and their horns and it, it doesn't bother them. But to a human being, even if you were, uh, you know, in protective equipment, you, you might not survive it. So um, being that and then being that he, uh, he got quite aggressive and he started to push the fences and, and really, uh, damage the, uh, the system we had to call them. Um, but like I said, we're looking at getting another, uh, bull or two, um, where the ages are far enough apart where they won't compete against one another, but kind of that they can support one another to grow and develop because I think, uh, in the, in the wild, the bison, the older bison bulls, oftentimes kind of keep the younger bison bulls in line and make sure that they're not getting too crazy. So, 
so that's part of what we're working on expanding the herd and making sure that we can uh, keep regenerating this you know incredible animal and make sure that it um, it expands and that the bison return to North America um, and with that you know making sure that we have the equipment the expertise to manage these incredible air animals so um, here's a, a couple of links my number email and then uh, a little more about the bison project uh, or bison people land uh, we don't have an official website just yet we're still developing that for bison people land but what we do is a, a page on our farmer uh, business which is helpers mentoring society and that's under uh, the bison project so that's the link there if you want to read more all right that's a yeah i think that's uh what i can share at this point um and hopefully that was helpful and informative thanks like Al. i said i haven't done powerpoint in a long time peter <laughs> well you know the, uh, it's the three minutes per slide anyway um there's also a page on the erc community uh page uh on the on erc.earth you also have a web page there um uh and 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 have those activities posted on that page too sal because maybe you can you can find new audiences to go and participate in your camps um i saw in the chat one question which is a very broad one what if you don't have access to bison how do you start restoring an ecosystem like this don't know if you can answer the question maybe others can but if there's anyone with a with a question uh, raise your hand. You can find it uh, in your thing with all the icons. There's something. Good. There's there's a button there with uh, uh, reactions, and that has a, a, a raise my hand. Uh, I've just raised mine uh, possibility, and then I can see who's raised their hand, and I can give you the virtual floor. And otherwise, uh, 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 the big question: what, 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 How would you do this if you didn't have bison, uh, Sal? Yeah, you know, the, so this is where I think um, you go back to the plants, the plant, um, and especially the trees. In this region, you know, this area, which has been impacted by fire, which would have normally been much more wooded than um, the the trees that uh, rehabilitate the environment are kind of essential. And, and as I've named, the aspen is one of those trees, which is um, a nursery tree, you know, in... For those who know about the aspen, um, they're really incredible trees, very much like the bison. Um, they have an ability to endure, and their job is uh, when wildfires fires come through, um, they get burnt too, but it doesn't burn the roots, and then they come back. And it's understood that um, the biggest, if not one of the biggest organisms, singular organism on the planet is an aspen grove in Colorado, and they it covers, I believe, miles, um, and it is uh, at least eighty thousand years old. So there, these are the these are the species that we look to, where we say, okay, they're enduring species that um, have this kind of place within the ecosystem to actually manage the rehabilitation of that location. So working with something like the aspen groves is a great way to um, help heal the land. Now out in the Great Plains, it's a little different because aspens don't grow there, but you do have certain trees like the cottonwood, um, where if you manage the cottonwood right, then you're gonna also affect the water systems tremendously because the cottonwoods, um, they, they uh, are, you know, they love water. They love just drawing that water up. And too many cottonwoods is actually really detrimental, but none, is also detrimental so so making sure that there's the the right amount of cottonwoods where the the streams and the rivers can flow um but they're um not eroding away and just becoming these big washes which pull all the topsoil off every time it rains so those are a couple of suggestions i could offer into the mix and you know bison you know honestly um we've been in a big experiment with this in the last three, four years with getting our, our bison. And uh, we went to the national conference. We went to the local conferences before we purchased the bison, before we took these steps. And um, there's a lot of different approaches to this and everyone you know that has done this will really say there is no right way to do it. Um, we're, we're all figuring it out as we go. 
And we started with a very small herd and a very small plot of land and figuring out the systems. And everyone who's done it in a massive way has all come back and said that is actually very smart. They all said, you did, you're doing it the right way because we did it with like 100 bison and we had to figure all this out and it really crashed and burned a number of times until we did. So it doesn't actually take very much to start with a couple of bison on a small plot of land. Um, you just want to make sure that your exterior fencing can handle the bison. And funny enough, most people think it's got to be like a fortress and it really doesn't. We have five strand barbed wire and our animals respect that and you know, as long as they have what they need, uh, they really, they don't mind that. Um, the only difficulty I had or we had with it was obviously our bull when he hit a certain age and um, he didn't have an older bull to manage his behavior. So he, he went a little bit um, too aggressive for what we could deal with. And so we had to adjust for that, but we're, we're continuing on. Yeah. That's what I can offer in the moment. There's a few more questions in the chat, but John raised his hand. John. Right. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Uh, that presentation is excellent. And I, I think it might be interesting to consider having a, uh, a workshop for natural building. Um, there are some ways to dig down below the surface and you're at altitude, you're at almost 2000 meters. So this is really a, a, a good way to do it. You can go down and this, this about a meter and a half to two meters below the surface, it'll always be uh, about 50 degrees or 45 degrees Fahrenheit, about 12 to 15 degrees centigrade. And then from there, you could use really big rocks and, and you could use straw bale. You can do a lot of things for th thermal mass. And then you can have passive solar um, going in and you can have active photovoltaics to have electricity if you need it. But I think if you put, put it with a lot of thermal mass and, and, and suck in the, the heat, you could really keep it warm even in the winter. So what about having a uh, next year when the spring comes, have a, a workshop and organize people to come out to build an example of that, uh, maybe for food storage or for whatever you want in the, in the beginning. And, but once you know these techniques, you can just use it for bigger and bigger things. I think that a lot of people would probably go. I, I think uh, we know in Paradise, California, huge numbers of people came to help help there. So might want to try. Yeah, that. yeah. I've actually I've actually been researching that, and I think that's a that's to me the most one of the most viable options for sure. Because um, again, the landscape being as harsh as as it is. Um, uh, earth shelters of some sort make the most sense. And um, uh, I've reached out to one organization, Dome Gaia, um, to see if they would actually uh, come and, and do a workshop here. Um, but that's that's as far as I've been able to take it. I, I don't have the network of, you know, people that have that skill or that knowledge. And, um, you know, I'm happy to, to, to work with it. I just don't know um, the people that would, would actually bring the, the skills and it's another thing, you know, that, you know, this is a little side note, but on the Pine Ridge Reservation, there's a huge housing crisis. And um, and even my own family on the reservation, you know, there's like 18 people in a, in a two, three bedroom house um, because there's just not enough housing. So you end up with these, these situations. So, uh, you know, actually having uh, kind of not more natural structures for people to reside in would be an incredible thing as well if that would be possible. And the reservation is one of those places where uh, it actually is as compared to, you know, some of the le legal issues that you might find off the reservation with something like that. Um, so I'm very interested in that. Yeah. So if, if anybody has any recommendations around natural building, definitely earth shelters, uh, let me know. All right. Uh, I know quite a lot of people. Here. And I will help you in any way I can. Please get in touch with me. 
you know how to find each other, John and, and Sal. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a few questions in the in the chat. Uh, one, a very basic one. Uh, what is the natural lifespan of a bison, Sal? Yeah, so in nature, um, it's somewhere around 15 to 20 years. They have been recorded uh, in captivity, living up to about 25 years. Um, the the oldest bison, I believe it's like 27 that's ever been recorded, and that was in, a, I believe, the Bronx Zoo. So in nature, uh, obviously, lifespans tend to be a little bit shorter, uh, but, you know, the 20-year mark is... is um, kind of like a, a fully grown adult bison that has lived a very long life. All right. Thanks. Um, a question from Alyssa. Sal, have you seen more water retention over the land due to wallowing? Yes. Yeah, that's actually another one of those um, aspects of the bison. Cattle don't waddle, wallow. So the bison, uh, they create wallows. And I wish uh, if I had the picture the right picture you could see it back behind me there's actually a couple of wallows um where they'll get on the on the dirt and they'll roll and they use their horns to dig up and they just like laying in the in the dirt and they take dust baths in it and it creates these indentations where then the water can actually pool up and it, it doesn't happen quite the same way because we're up in the hills and the soil's different but out in the prairie where there's more uh silica so there it's more clay like then it actually kind of hard bakes it and it turns it into um uh, a clay pool and um and then and then the water is held for much longer up here it's it's more fine um and what ends up happening is that it doesn't retain quite so long but um it does happen here for sure and it has shifted the ecology you know, on the water flow patterns significantly, I've noticed. Um, we used to have a lot more runoff that would come down. And then uh, the way the landscape here is, it's actually sloped. So um, this is our backyard. If the picture behind me is essentially the backyard going up into the, about 23 acres. And um, it used to be that the water would just rush down and then funnel into a wash and then actually kind of run through our driveway and then down into a, a stream below us where spring is um, and that's just not happening anymore and I attribute some of that is to the water infiltrating and not just going across the land um, and actually going into the soil so um, yeah that that's been really interesting to see with the bison over the last few years okay there uh, another response I think in, in response to Ruth is Bart who says in Europe you can borrow semi-wild herbivores from the European Wildlife Bank with a herd contract. Is anything like that exist in Calgary, Ruth, or Sal, do you know, in Canada or the U.S.? Yeah, I, I, not that I know of at this point in time. You know, the, no. the, the big thing with the bison in this region is, is definitely with the indigenous, uh, the tribes um, receiving a, a bison from like Yellowstone where they would normally have just been shot because the bison try to migrate out of this harsh condition every year. And now they're redistributing these bison off to the indigenous communities. Um, so that's, that's like, maybe not quite the same, but obviously it, it, it's um, getting the bison back to the land. Oh, it's maybe something to consider. So once your herd grows to start yes. sending them to other ecosystem restoration projects. Yep. As as yep. You teach them how to, how to work with them. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, there's a there's a comment about who's planting seeds. Um, Heidi asks, uh, uh, I think it's Heidi, in the uplands, are the waters held more by their trace lines? I'm not sure what that really don't means. actually know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. In the uplands, are the waters held more by? Uh, you mean the the tracks that bison walk? Is that what you mean? Maybe Heidi. Uh, you, open your microphone and explain what exactly you mean like micro rivers from the trails yeah. that they make yeah, yeah um, my understanding out in soft like out in uh, wyoming and such there's a whole ecosystem that's been lost because yeah. of their the the river the micro rivers the fractaling of rivers that's made from their movements across the land and i was wondering if if maybe that's how it works in uplands where the soil's not so soft yeah, it's a good question. I I um, would imagine if, you know, just looking at 
um, the the trails that have been made, which we try to we try to limit that to some degree because you know obviously if a trail becomes a rut, it becomes an erosion site, and you know that that can have its own issues. But but looking at where the patterns of movement are, there's definitely definitely um, different micro ecosystems that take place, and I, I haven't actually really you know, thought of that being just part of the, the, the trail. I think of it more from the, the dung perspective, you know, that, that as they move along, you know, and they're creating, um, they're creating the waste, but that waste is nutrient, so nutrient rich that um, you can see a difference between where they've moved extensively and where they have it. Um, but I, I will, I will, yeah, I'll look at that in a deeper way. And I would imagine that, um, you know, these small, these small ruts that are created are actually creating opportunities for water infiltration, which would shift the microsystems in that, in that location. So that's a great question. Another thing to track. Yeah. Uh, on my side of the planet is, it is 730 and I see people saying that they're, that they're, uh, <laughs> sorry, leaving the call. Uh, but there are more questions. Um, Bart, who came up with the suggestion of the Wildlife Bank, uh, asked if you vaccinate the animals against brucellosis. Gosh. So at the, up yeah, bur yeah, brucellosis yeah. is it's one of the big issues with cattle um, and bison and actually elk too. Uh, but it, it, it causes spontaneous abortions uh, with cattle. So the bison aren't affected by it. The elk aren't affected by it. And it's been used as a uh, a way to justify um the continued uh suppression of bison herds and um by the cattle industry which just to note the cattle industry is huge you know it's huge in north america i think you know if you think about like an industry of meat there's like two hundred thousand bison that are processed a year and i believe it's somewhere like it's in the tens of millions of cattle that are processed a year so Bison are very, very low on the priority scale of, you know, economics and pol politics and whatnot. Um, and, and so the brucellosis issue has been one of that the cattle ranchers have used to say bison are extinct. They're, you know, they need to be eliminated um, or it's going to affect the economy. Well, they've developed a, a immunization for uh, the bison, and that is pretty much now brucellosis is no longer a factor within the bison herd. It's still part of wild elk, but um, they say, well, buffalo or excuse me, elk and cattle don't in interact that way. So there would be no issue with that. And there hasn't been a historic case, as far as I know, that uh, in a, uh, an abortion, um, a miscarriage from a cattle from elk has happened. So it's a non-issue at this point. There are a few other issues, especially with sheep and bison. Um, sheep have a particular um uh, virus which they are immune to but bison are not and it can actually kill bison quite easily so they're working on some immunization around that but brucellosis has become a non-issue now that they have a vaccination for it and so it's not throughout the herds anymore the everlasting tension between um modern agriculture and what we're trying to achieve um Albert Bates, the everlasting wise Albert Bates, has a commercial suggestion for you. Uh, to uh, it, I'll, I'll just read the, the chat. It occurs to me, Sal, could do bison biochar, TM, like the dromedary dung at COP28. John, you apparently missed this, or did at least not speak about it. Just as good as the Hopi Rainmakers. Or, uh, or, and then it says, Camelicious Camel Dairy Farm of 8,500 camels is there in Dubai. And they're now charring camel poo, which is previously landfilled. Could be another income stream for bison people land, or at least fertilizers for home gardens on the res. And there's a heart from Mick. Anyway, uh, have you ever thought of biocharring the poo from the bisons? I have not. Yeah, <laughs> really fascinated by bio biochar, but um, I have not tried uh, biocharring the the manure we we've we've used it in many many different ways including gardening and um you know composting and whatnot and it's it's really incredible uh manure you know really fertile but um i'll have to i'll have to look into that more for sure yeah all right that's possible why not 
everyone read the chat because Albert is inviting you to uh, a, a meeting tomorrow and then people are leaving again. Any more questions for Sal? Thank you, Heidi, and thank you also to uh, Leah for the, the thanks. Um, any more questions for Sal? More thank yous. All right. Um, well, the floor is open for anything you would like to discuss. It is a fireside. The fire behind John still burning, although I think it's fake. Um, uh, or, or are you free to leave, of course? Um, anything you'd like to share extra? I think you talked about it a great deal, but in our preparatory call, you also talked about uh, the tribal land and, and the past. And uh, I know there's quite a few of the EUCs in California. I think, Jonathan, you're still here. Some people are also uh, actively dealing with this. Is there anything you've learned there that, you know, you, you can share about that indigenous knowledge uh, vis a vis or you're doing? You shared a bit about it in your presentation, but I thought there was an important point there. Um, well, so what can I say about it? It's, it's hard to say like which angle to take on it. Um, yeah, there's thousands. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I think the main thing is people, people come in oftentimes to the, you know, kind of the, especially from the outside uh, perspective of, of, the native American through, you know, books like black elk speaks, um, you know, named their seeker of visions, um, uh, fool's crow books with John Mills. So these, these are very well-known, um, Lakota, uh, contributors and authors, and, you know, they're very spiritual people, um, you know, and they, they've had a, a really big impact on, um, Kind of like a, a worldview understanding and getting that transmitted off into the world so um i think when people come into contact with that and i know myself included it's very interesting it's very attractive because it's such a different worldview it's such a different mindset i guess and um it it's it's a relational mindset you know so everything is about how are things related how am i related to this and, and what's the experience of that relationship? And the language itself actually is all about the, the relationship and the movement of relationship. So the, the worldview is, is profoundly different. And, and I think people um, hear it as uh, more of a spiritual or philosophical or even a religious mindset, but it's actually incredibly practical. I say pragmatic, you know, like, uh, and, and this is um, an understanding I've gained through the Lakota, but also many ind indigenous peoples and, and worldviews is that, you know, they, they don't really have time to waste. Um, my, my, one of my teachers who we call grandma, um, she was uh, uh, Victoria Chips was her name, but um, you know, everyone knew her as grandma relationally, right? She was, a, and she, she was asked one time, what is traditional? And she thought about it for a while. And she, her answer she came back with is she said, what works? Like in our worldview, traditional, it's not, you know, some obscure process or some idea of like what the ancestors did. And we need to continue this tradition. She said, traditional and this way of thinking is what works. So it's got to produce results. And um, I think I think the the relational mindset and the relational um uh, perspective is what works for humanity you know we could think of that as a traditional way of approaching life in the in the world that we live in and and again it, it can be very philosophical but when you put it into real world living you know like we need to be in relationship to the animals to the plants to the soil and i'm sure you know like i talked to certain groups and about this and it's it's kind of a uh, eye-opening and awakening and you know this group is like yeah uh, I'm speaking already to people who understand this, you know, so it's like we, we, um, we kind of have to recognize that the modern perspective is much more objectifying. Even the language is about objects. Um, it's about, it's not about relationship. It's oftentimes it has maybe a little more power dynamic of authority or, you know, control, um, 
and it, it, it it's not a bad thing it has its place in a in the world in kind of in a way of thinking but it's not the answer to um, the problems that we face so with that when you're working with indigenous um, wisdom it's like okay how is this practical and then when you're working with in, indigenous people it has to be relational based um, so a lot of times you know we know the stories where you know some some uh, well-intentioned group or organization or person comes into an indigenous community and starts dictating like, this is what you need to do because this is what we know. And the indigenous people reject it. They don't like it. And if they try it, it typically doesn't work anyways. I I remember one story where they planted big gardens in Africa and then uh, they said, we never do this. And then they found out because the hippos come in that once the fruits and the vegetables are ready and they just eat all the, we can't do this because it doesn't work here. And the indigenous people have this knowledge where if we listen to that and we come into a relationship with them, you know, that's where the collaboration, the allyship can really actually work. Um, And then, you know, especially the Lakota, I would say this generally for all indigenous people, but the Lakota are very open to sharing with people that will listen, you know, as they would say that have ears to listen, you know, because they want to live they want the earth to live they want us to live even we we all want to live and this is how life can work so um you know really quickly you find oh all this information is available all this understanding is available um and the methods of of implementation and the methods of understanding might be slightly different but when you come in you know into this um dynamic you know just know that this relational component is at the core of of uh the the dialogue the exchange the the working together and um and i think if we approach it like that man there's so much that we can learn you know and there's so many ways that we can figure out how to implement this for everyone's health and happiness so yeah that's a little something i could take i mean i could take it in other, other directions though too <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, that 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 wisdom, and people are reacting to it in the chat. Speaking about bringing ideas to indigenous people, that's not it, and that's a joke, Sean. But uh, he'd love to discuss the idea of uh, natural building and how this group might help you create a practical workshop to build natural buildings. And then Albert um, suggests hosting a natural building colloquium. There was one just before the pandemic at Black Range Lodge in, sorry for Europeans, NM. I actually don't know where the, what's NM in what's which state is that NM? Oh, New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Sorry, um, there are quite some builders there. So anyway, there's some interest by Albert and John, and maybe you guys can connect. New Mexico, thank you. Uh, uh, about this, uh, if if you're interested, um, and create some relationships before getting started in the in the area. Um, and I leave that to you guys to decide in the not but not putting you on the spot, Sal. Uh offline, but you know how to reach each other. Albert can be reached also through us. You let me know. He's he's in our advisory council. Um but John would like to discuss this with this group. So if you're interested to discuss that with John, I think you'd stick around. And if you're thinking that's beyond me, uh you you know, feel feel free to go. It's way past the hour that we promised you. Uh, so um, thank you for being here thank you for participating again uh, if you think this is great and you wish to share some of your private resources with uh, with Sal go to our website find this page and, and use it to reach out or to donate directly to him but also you can reach out to him he'll get the mails uh, uh, directly and uh, I, John if I can leave it to you if you wish to see if people want to discuss natural building with you I think uh, Albert's interested. Um, go ahead, and uh, Sal, if you think I'm not ready for that yet, I'm tired after an hour-long presentation. Uh, feel free to, of course. But thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for sharing your your deep insights and all your knowledge, extensive knowledge, about uh, what you're working on. Um, I, I what I see in the chat, people learned a few things. People will find it quite informative. Thanks. Thanks you so much for sharing your uh, your insights and knowledge with everyone here.